Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, the project that, uh, that we're working at here. It's, uh, it's sort of a joint partnership uh, with NC State uh, and XFAB with, with support, of course, from uh, from Power America. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, and jump right in here. Um, my slides. Uh, my slides are not advanced. Okay. Um, there we go. Okay, sounds good. Um, Anyway, so jumping into the first slide here with the, uh, I mean, and these are the sort of things that everyone on this call I'm sure knows, but just for, for a point of review, uh, you know, most power devices are fabricated from silicon, but, you know, materials properties of silicon carbide are, are more favorable for power applications. We're talking about a much higher breakdown field, uh, higher thermal conductivity, um, um, drip velocity, and all these sort of things. So um, theoretically speaking, just looking at the, um, just looking at the materials properties, you would think that silicon carbide would make would make a much better uh, much better power device. Um, next slide. Yeah. In trouble with this. Um, and of course, you get the uh, you get the advantages in uh, in, in silicon carbide based devices with the NF texture lay layers based on um, uh, because you can build them higher because you can get the thinner epi, you can do the um, get lower conduction losses. Problem comes in a little bit on the uh, on the next side when you think about the economics of um, of, of silicon carbide and the challenges you face when you go ahead and, and, and try to fabricate them. Uh, silicon is nice and easy. Um, why do I say that? I say that because temperatures are generally pretty low, uh, and I'm going to define low temperature as anything below 1100 degrees C, because you can process things at 11, below 1100 degrees C if you use force for everything. Uh, not the case with silicon carbide. Um, silicon carbide has a number of higher temperature um, type processes that, that are needed. Um, oxidation of the uh, creation of the gate via oxidation is one way. Um, ion implantation, of course, is another one. You cannot diffusion dope silicon carbide, so everything has to be uh, implanted, and of course, that requires a post oxidation and a post uh, implant anneal, which is also high temperature. And the effect to growth of uh, silicon carbide as well is, is very high temperature. So you're looking at some sort of very specialized processing and very specialized equipment uh, that is needed if you want to play the, uh, the silicon carbide fabrication game. Uh, you also have the, point with the problem of being sort of behind the curve, so to speak, in silicon carbide. Uh, we've been fabricating silicon for um, 50, 60, 70 years now. Um, I have a number here on this slide, 13 sextillion um, silicon-based MOSFET devices have been manufactured. So if we want to go ahead and catch up uh, silicon carbide to silicon processing, we have a, a long way to go. Um, so how are we going to do this specifically from a, a, a sort of, not, not maybe from a scientific point of view, but from a practical kind of marketing and, and economic point of view? Um, because in order to get the, the high temperature things, the ion implanters, the high temperature furnaces, uh, all the other sort of um, factors that you need in order to go to the silicon carbide manufacturing, um, it's a high capital intensive cost. Um, so places like XFAB, places like Cree, places like WolfSpeed can go ahead and put the millions upon millions of dollars to go ahead and get the equipment that they need. Um, universities, such as NC State or anywhere else, it's a little bit more difficult uh, those of us who, who work at universities know that we can't just go out and, and, and buy an ion implanter on a whim. We can't just go out and, and buy an 1,800-degree uh, um, oxidation furnace or anneal furnace at a whim. Uh, it's more difficult. The flip side of that is that in places like, like, like XFAB, who are the, um, uh, or the higher dollar places, um, they don't have the flexibility. These are the kind of places that want to do things, um, you know, hundreds, thousands of wafers a month. They don't want to deal with one or two wafers at a time. Uh, universities, we're happy to do that because um, one of the things about small lots and, and single wafer lots is that's where a lot of the disruptive technologies take place. If you want to try something, if someone comes up with an idea, well, I want to, I want to try this as a gate design. Um, I want to try this material as a dope. Mix. I want to do this. I want to do that. These, these little kind of ideas that, that sort of germinate and then spread, which is sort of the basis of, um, of how disruptive technology takes place. We can do that at university fab schools. We can work with things um, one way for two way for three wafers at a time, or even way for pieces. You can't do that in next fab. Um, so as you can see here on slide number five, we get down to the bottom. The industrial fabs have the dollars for the capital equipment, but they don't have the flexibility. They don't have the uh, sort of dynamic structure to work with the small lot. It just doesn't make sense for them from the county's scale point of view. The 
university fabs, we're happy to do that. We're willing to do that, but we don't have the funding. Um, we could get little onesies and twosies here and there, you know, whether we beg our department heads or our deans for some dollars or get an MRI, but we don't have the ability to go ahead and put millions of dollars of infrastructure in place at a moment's notice. So we have one strength on one side, one strength on the other side. How do we push them together? How do we bring a gap? How do we create a situation where we have a, a, a fab that can do the type of things that the large fabs could do, um, but also have the flexibility to, to, to work with smaller lots? And that's where Power America comes in, and that's where XFAB and, and NMS come in, is, is we're trying to set up a system uh, where we here at, at NC State, at, specifically at the, at the NC State Nano Fabrication Facility, which I'll get in, in, into a bit, um, act as what's called a feeder fab uh, for XFAB. Basically, XFAB has folks coming to them all the time. We, we have these great ideas. We want to do these little onesies and twosies. We want to do one wafer. We want to do a small lot. And XFAB can't do that. But here at NC State, we can go ahead and, and, and set up a set of specific process blocks to show that we can do things, you know, in the same fashion that XFAB does. Excuse me? Oh, things like, um, things like, uh, things, things like making a gate stack uh, on silicon carbide, for example. Things like making an ILD, making on the contacts, uh, making a hard mass for implant. If we can do these things in the same fashion that XFAB does, well, the next fab could send their small one and two lot, one and two wafer and small lot customers to us. We could go ahead and, and work on the process and send them back to XFAB for, for the larger production. This is kind of the, the sort of best of both worlds, where you actually get the, um, uh, the sort of expertise and the process control of a place like XFAB, but you get the dynamic flexibility of a university like we have here at, uh, like we have here at NC State. Um, of course, to do something like this is, is going to take some is going to take some dollars. Uh, at NNF, um, you know, as of as, as of one year ago, we didn't have these high temperature furnaces. We didn't have these capabilities in place. We we're busy with our quote unquote day job. Uh, and this is where Power America comes in. Power America sort of saw this need, and they said, if we're going to go ahead and provide companies with with access to silicon carbide technology and be able to sort of um, with this vision of using a small dynamic fab to do big fat kind of stuff. And then they have the next step, they're, they're going to need some dollars to do this, and, and Power America stepped up to the plate, and they're, they're helping here, working with us here, um, to go ahead and set up these, these sort of discrete process blocks that XFAP has, has done in the past, and are trying to transfer here to a university fab. So, talking a little bit about in and out, our next slide, slide number seven, what are we? We're a class 100, a class 1000 clean work on NC State Centennial Campus. What does that mean? That means most of our fab is class 100. We have a few areas class 1000. Um, that, that's good enough to do the work that we want to do here. Uh, we provide some regular processing capability to, to academic groups, to, uh, to industry, to government clients. Um, we're talking about a, a number of different, uh, five different colleges around the country, all, uh, around, the, around the campus, send their, uh, send their students here to learn how to use the FAB. Several different small, mid-sized, even large companies use our FAB as well. Uh, folks from NREL have come and use our FAB as well. So we're very, very dynamic, very flexible, uh, overall, encompassing, overall encompassing FAB. Uh, and it's a sort of small dynamic university FAB that will quickly demonstrate the type of breakthroughs that we need to see in silicon carbide fabrication and silicon carbide processing if we want to go ahead and catch up to the uh, to what we do in silicon these days. Um, next slide going ahead, we have lithography, we have CBD, uh, chemical vapor deposition, both plasma enhanced and low pressure chemical vapor deposition, both of which are very important for silicon carbide processing. Uh, thermal wet processes, plasma etching, again, very important for silicon carbide, um, uh, PVD, metallization, metrology, wafer dicing. These are all the sorts of the, the sort of tool suite we have here at NNF. So we have basically what we need um, to do some, some silicon carbide processing, but as we talk about a little further on, we need a little bit, a little bit of help, a little bit of upgrade to these equipment, these pieces of equipment to get ourselves set for the uh, high temperature type processing and more advanced processing, more challenging processing that silicon carbide requires as opposed to traditional silicon. Um, if you look specifically at slide number nine, you see some of the things that are, are being very heavily utilized by, by the uh, this Power America project, because these are things that are necessary to make the uh, silicon carbide MOSFET devices. Uh, first is, of course, an eye-line stepper. Uh, for something like a, um, like a standard contact lithography, you're going to get down to one, maybe two microns, but for silicon carbide, we need, we need to be able to do better. Uh, so we use the GTA eye-line stepper as production lithography tool. 
um, or it's a projection lithography tool, and that, that we have demonstrated to get all the way down to 500 nanometers in, uh, in line with. Um, low pressure and chemical and plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition, this is used to grow the various, um, I'm sorry, I'm going backwards, or too quickly. As to the various uh, polycrystalline and, uh, and, and SIM2 processes that we need to, in order to uh, in order to move forward and build the complex silicon carbide devices, and also the uh, plasma etching, of course, as well, uh, fluorine and fluorine-based plasma etchers we have, which will uh, are, are necessary for these for these devices. NNF is also st strong because it participates in RTNN, which is a research triangle nanotechnology network. Um, and to bear with me for a minute on this slide, I know there's a lot of acronyms. Um, the, what the RTNN is, is it's part of the uh, NSF-funded NNCI, which is the National Nanotechnology Coordinated Infrastructure. What this basically means is that NSF has identified 16 different sites throughout the country. And these sites are, are basically, to, to, put it, to put it simply, uh, nanotechnology hubs. There are groups of universities, uh, of community colleges, uh, of other groups that have gotten together and have a very strong core, very strong small geographic core of nanotechnology capabilities. Uh, we have one here uh, in the triangle, of course, with um, both NNF and AIF, the analytical instrumentation, both from NC State. The shared materials and instrumentation facility at Duke and, uh, and, and the, the Capital Analytical and Nanofabrication Laboratory. The four of us make the, uh, the, the Research Triangle Nanotechnology Network, the RTNN which means that we sort of uh, lean on each other and work with each other and sort of back, back each other up on, on, on sort of tooling and expertise and, and just sort of bounce ideas off one another. Um, and we also work together to try to over, overcome common barriers to, uh, to nanotechnology. There's a, there's a lot of folks out there um, in K-12 schools, in community colleges, in small business who could benefit, benefit greatly from access to nanotechnology but it's hard to get, whether it be from cost or awareness or, or distance. And we at RCNN try to go ahead and, and, and overcome that hump, overcome those obstacles, and, and introduce the folks around the state of North Carolina to nanotechnology. Um, and that also plays a role into what we do in this project because our work with, um, with community colleges, with K-12, with the small companies, um, sort of strengthens our, strengthens our background, strengthens our capabilities. We can go ahead and, and, and carry out the tasks we need to on this project. Uh, specific process blocks we developed here. For those of you familiar with silicon carbide uh, fabrication, these will be um, uh, no real surprise. Um, first is the hard mass definition, and this defines the area and the way for where the DOPA, the DOPA, DOPA implantation is going to be taking place. This is important because, as I mentioned earlier, you cannot diffusion dope um, silicon carbide. Uh, ion implantation is the only way to do it. Um, and and what, the, what the hard mask allows you to do is it allows you to cover the parts of your wafer where you do not want the ion implantation to take place. And again, where that, that's where your doping will not take place. Um, and again, your, your photo processes and your uh, edge processes are going are to define, you know, how fine those areas can be, how tight that area, that area can be. Uh, the gate fabrication, everyone knows the way, uh, the way a monster works, but having to oxidize uh, silicon carbide is much, much more difficult, uh, much, much more challenging. Um, than oxidizing silicon, in addition to the oxidation, there's, there's the electrode as well, um, which involves some polysilicon growth and doping, and that that technique as well needs to be uh, needs to be uh, developed here. Inner layer dielectric will actually insulate the top metal layer from underlying gate structure, and last, of course, is the uh, is the contact because when you have a uh, you need to be able to connect your uh, silicon carbide your power devices to the outside world. And you need a low resistance contact in order to do a low resistance metal contact to do that, which is known as, uh, as an ohmic contact. Uh, the mass design, as you see here, we took a lot of, uh, the team took a lot of time and a lot of effort to develop this, uh, this, this particular mask. There are 11 layers uh, to this mask, just to show the complexity of what we're, what we're trying to do here in order to hit the goals of each of the four, complex, uh, each of the four process blocks. Uh, we do have a design for a power MOSFET um, device, even though we are not not specifically um, uh, have on our, on our SOCO for this project a, to make a MOSFET. It's just basically the uh, the process blocks. We do, as a sort of a stretch goal for this process, uh, for this project, we do want to see if we can go ahead and follow through to make, the pro make, make a MOSFET, whether it be within the confines of the project itself or, you know, to build on this afterwards. 
Uh, and again, capacitors for testing our um, um, for testing our, our oxide. Uh, long chain of MOSFET for, for, for mobility. TLM will help us with our um, um, ohm of contact to measure specific contact resistivity. Uh, some physical test structures and, and LV alignment marks and everything that are, that, that makes total uh, such a lot of fun. So jumping into the individual process blocks, the first one is uh, is, is the hard mask. And again, this is the um, uh, process by which we cover up the area on the on the wafer surface where we do not want the um, where we don't want the implant to go. Uh, the first step of this is actually figuring out um, where the implant is going to go and how, how far the implant will go into your uh, into your oxide. We did some Monte Carlo simulations, and we found that for um, an implant energy of 360 kV, which is fairly typical for aluminum ions, which are used for, for feedback doping of silicon carbide, 1.1 uh, micron uh, of SiO2 is, is probably going to be sufficient. Um, we went ahead and we bumped that up a little bit to 1.4 micron in case we want to go ahead and play around with the energy a little bit, but a little bit higher energy for a little bit of uh, a little bit deeper implant. Uh, and plus with, our, uh, with the selectivity of the, um, uh, of the photoresist uh, mass versus the oxide, we found that we could actually get the features we need with the uh, 1.4 micron uh, thick oxide. So we went ahead and we, we, we grew, grew the oxide, we uh, um, did the photo and the edge, and as you can see here on slide 14, we were able to get very, very vertical sidewalls. Uh, and able to get all the way down through the entire through the entire mask to, to the exposed um, um, silicon carbide surface uh, down to features which are about 1.4 microns uh, 1.4 microns wide. We're still doing the microscopy on the uh, going down to 500 microns. We have those uh, those patterns as well. Uh, microscopy isn't quite those uh, isn't quite done on those at least to the point where I can show them here. Uh, but the initial initial look at that those is, is very promising. Following the uh, next step is going to be the uh, gate fabrication. Uh, the gate fabrication requires several different steps. The first is the oxidation of the um, of the of the silicon carbide surface. About 50 microns, 40 to 50 microns is, is typically uh, used for a gate. And then there's going to be post oxidation meal with a nitrogen containing gas. Um, nitric oxide is the is gas of choice, but uh, nitric oxide is also uh, very very toxic. Uh, so even though we planned uh, during this project to use nitric oxide, I think we're going to have to move away from that from uh, for for safety concerns with our furnace. Uh, so N2O well is going to be a short term a better option for this project to get the results we need within the, within the period of performance that we have for, for Power America. Uh, moving forward, the goal of NNF is going to be to use nitric oxide for this uh, for this task. Um, we did have a silicon oxidation furnace, but again, as I talked about earlier, uh, silicon oxidation furnaces get up to around 1100 degrees C and no start to soften, no start to sag, that sort of thing. So we need to upgrade the, um, the furnace to go up to, uh, to 1250 to 1275 temperature range. Uh, and that's going to be good for both the oxidation and the uh, nitrogen gas containing post oxidation anneal. Uh, of course, when you go ahead and get a new furnace in place, a new oxidation furnace in place, you want to make sure it's nice and clean. I want to make sure you get the um, oxide quality that you want. So what we did is we fabricated some uh, some thymol, some silicon-based uh, MOS devices uh, with the upgraded furnace, uh, just using aluminum contact, and we want to verify the uh, oxide quality. And so going on to slide 16, um, we are actually fairly happy with the uh, with the results we got here. We did get a little bit. If you look at the top slide, we did get a little bit of a hysteresis. Um, that probably means we have a little bit of uh, dangling bond left in the on the oxide, which is you know the lack of uh, post oxidation meal will lead to that. But this reason is small enough that we're not concerned. Uh, we measured with the uh, our goal and our measurement with the uh, nanometrics, uh, basically with the ultrasonometry technique. Uh, we got 50 nanometers, and the measurement and from the um, um, measurements we have here, we, we, we calculated an oxide thickness of 49.7, so we're right on where we need to be, which is nice. Um, I think the, the best news we got is down here is we got an oxide breakdown of 10 to 11 megavolts per centimeter uh, in three of our six devices. So again, from a um, uh, from a repeatability point of view, I think we need to do a little bit better. Um, we had two voltage, two devices that didn't, didn't break down, probably due to leakage, and one just broke down at really low voltage. But the ones that did behave the way we wanted them to, we did get a nice uh, 10 to 11 megavolt per, per centimeter uh, 
breakdown field, which is what we would expect from uh, from some silicon MOSFET. Uh, so we're really happy with this. So we're making good progress here on getting our oxide qualified for the uh, for the project. To get electrode fabrication again, as, as with the um, after you grow your after you uh, thermally grow your oxide on your silicon carbide, you're going to need to have an electrode on your on your oxide so it's connected to the uh, to the outside outside world. Um, that's going to require a polysilicon. Um, it, it is a more popular choice than metal, just because of diffusion diffusion issue. Uh, of course, the polysilicon is going to have to be doped as well. Um, typically, with phosphorus is what we're working on. Um, we have had some equipment challenges in this particular um, these particular fabrication steps. We're having some problems with the LPCVD growth of the uh, of the polysilicon, so we've had to outsource that project uh, that aspect of the project temporarily. Um, but once we get get that back in and get going again, we'll be able to go ahead and, and, and get our doping down and hopefully get a, get get a good gate electro down. Probably within the next two to three weeks is, is what we expect. Um, once we have our, our, our ducks in the row here. <clears throat> Moving ahead, the ILD, and again, the the inner layer dielectric is a, um, a is a dielectric layer which is going to electrically insulate your your bottom your your oxide layers from what you have your your metal layers on top. Um, and, and of course, we use, use an oxide typically for for an ILD. And what the challenge of this is is you don't want to have the, this the sort of sharp corners. Uh, you would typically get in a in a microelectronic device. You want to be able to have a nice nice rounded corners, nice, nice smooth profile um, on your on your ILD. Uh, if you just deposit a, a, an oxide as is, you're going to get something that's going to be angular. It's going to be too sharp, and there's going to be some some pinch off points, which you're going to want to avoid. So uh, there, there's really two ways that you can go ahead and, and have the um, and get around the corners. Uh, one is to grow what we call BPSG, which is borophosphate silicate glass, and that means you just grow your silicon dioxide and you actually put that about 4% boron, 4% phosphorus, and what that will do is, is the inclusion of the boron and the phosphorus will allow you, will, will depress the melting temperature of the oxide, and what it will do is allow you to close the meal at around 850 degrees C, which you're not going to negatively, at that temperature, you're not going to negatively affect the rest of your, uh, your device, but you are going to reflow your oxide and you're going to smooth everything out and get around the corners you need. Um, we looked into that a little bit. The, the, the equipment concerns with that, the, the sort of capital cost we required to get that set up was going to be uh, two time and dollar intensive for this project. Uh, so what we're going to do is with PECVD deposition of undoped silicon dioxide, and, and what we'll actually do is even though we'll, we'll deposit the uh, oxide with, the, with some sharper features, we can actually use uh, lithography and edge to go ahead and get some rounded features in. Um, so, so B, the um, PECVD with the post uh, post deposition processing is what we're going to do in order to get the features that we need. Uh, and again, the preliminary results are encouraging uh, from a lithography point of view. This is this is perfect. This is uh, this is exactly what we want to see. As you see on the, in the pictures here on the left in slide 19, uh, you can see the nice rounded features in the uh, in, in the photolithography. Um, now the next challenge is to go ahead and use uh, use the next process to go ahead and transfer. Uh, that round of feature into the um, uh, into the oxide in which are, which we're going to be etching. Uh, those trials are on the way. I don't have results on them yet. Uh, and again, hopefully in a few weeks we'll be able to show that the uh, etch process was a, it was as uh, successful as the photo process in getting the uh, getting the round of profile shape. Uh, the last process block we're working on is the uh, the Oma contact block. Um, and this is something we, were, we haven't, this is the uh, sort of last quarter of the year, so we haven't done much uh, on this yet. It will involve the EVM evaporation uh, of a thousand nations of nickel and then you uh, anneal afterwards to form a nickel psilocyte. Uh, and it's basically it's nice because it's a self aligned self -aligned process. Uh, the, where the nickel is actually touching the uh, silicon carbide, it's going to form the psilocyte, otherwise, it's going to not. And then you just go ahead and do nickel nickel etch. The uh, nickel psilocyte will not etch away, and the nickel will. So, so there's no photolithography required there. It's just a self-aligning process. Um, the main data we're going to be looking for with this is getting the specific contact resistivity. So we'll be using the TLM method for that. If you remember the mask I showed earlier, we have some TLM patterns on there in order to go ahead and uh, and get that data that we need. And the uh, we have some silicon carbide wafers we're sending out for ion implant and anneal. Um, and once we get those back so in, the, in the late March, early April timeframe, we'll be able to go ahead and get started on the uh, on the metallization uh, self alignment etch in the um, uh, in, in the measurement for that. Are we doing our time? We're doing good. We have okay. another uh, five ten minutes to go. Okay.
Um, jumping ahead, the, the next thing I want to talk about is in addition to the um, silicon carbide uh, process blocks, which you've been talking about for the last little bit, uh, we've also gotten some funding from Power America to do a, a, a wide band gap short course. Uh, and, and, and this is something that we in NNF like to do. Um, working at a university, working with groups like RTNN, uh, we take the education aspect of, of what we do very, very seriously. Uh, and I think I, I view it as our responsibility in this fab, is not just to get the experimental results that people want to see. But actually use, use our platform, use our, our, our resources that we have uh, to teach as much as we can, whether that be university students, whether that be um, 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 high school students, whether that be uh, community college educators, whether that be uh, professionals in the field. Uh, use, use the opportunities and the resources we have uh, to get some teaching done. So I, I, I'm, I'm kind of passionate about this, uh, this aspect of what we do in the Internet. So one of the things that we've uh, asked Power America for is, is to set up a, a short course of, of wide, for wide banging apps and academics. We're working with the Analytical Instrumentation Facility, and again, the Analytical Instrumentation Facility is our sister facility, whereas we at NNF do all the uh, fabrication and processing, the AIS does the uh, microscopy and testing. The way I like to look at the breakdown is we make the stuff and they look at the stuff. Um, and so the two of us are working together for these uh, for the short courses, and we're going to run three sessions of a two-day short course focused on wide bang at power devices. And what the target participants for this are our professionals. This is not necessarily uh, university students, although we do allow them to join us. Our main focus for this is, uh, is, is, is professional engineers working in the field, working in this area, specifically those working with, for example, silicon or, 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 or some other material or, or some other field that wants to learn about wide being at power devices, basically to um, give them an opportunity to learn about what they could do so maybe they can transition their career into a wide band gap field to help strengthen the workforce of the U.S. in this area. Uh, session one was held in December. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that, some of the things we covered, and, and sessions two and three will be held in April and June, respectively. Uh, and the um, um, registration for the, for the session in April is actually open right now, so if anyone on the line is interested in, in joining us, we'd love to have you. Your information will be coming uh, on that. There we go. Um, session one, uh, these, these are some of the things we talked about in, in, in December. You can see the, uh, the participants in the center there. We had, uh, we had six folks, uh, six industry folks from, from around the triangle come and join us. We took them into the clean room, as you can see, and in some of the pictures where they're out, they're all suited up. We showed them things like metallization and ALD and photolithography and, and wet etch. Uh, Professor Veladius uh, delivered the, the keynote seminar at the, at the end of the second day and gave a nice, uh, really, really good sort of overview of, of power device technology, get folks excited about, about what, this, uh, what this technology can do. And, and also folks like uh, like BB and Phil Strader and, uh, and AAS so talked a lot about XID and microscopes and all that sort of thing. Uh, everything went over really well from a, um, uh, uh, from, from a, uh, a class point of view. As you can see, the assessments were, uh, were, were fairly glowing. Um, basically, what we did is we, we tried to do a good mix of, of sort of tours and, and classroom lecture type activities and, um, and, and hands on and lab type stuff. And we reached out to professors in, in, in material science and in, in ECE, and, and a lot of folks really contributed to make this, uh, make this really successful. Uh, and I'm, I'm excited about what we could do for, for April as well, which would which be the next thing. We've already started the marketing for that. and. Uh, Professor Ballas is going to be giving the, he's kind enough to give the, the keynote for us uh, in April, so we're really excited by, about having that. Um, and, and again, uh, speak to me, anyone, if you're, if you're interested in joining the, uh, the short course come, um, you know, come April, April 7th to 8th are the, uh, are the dates, and, and we're happy to have you. Um, that's all I have from, from a slides point of view. Is, are, there any, are there any questions on, on, on either the process box or short course or, or anything about Internet in general? Oh, thank you very much, Joe. That was a really, right, really good presentation. Very clear and a really good slide. I appreciate your time and preparing. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have time for questions. So, again, please uh, scroll down to the bottom of your screen, click on the little uh, chat. Uh, icon and type your questions in, and I'll read them out, and we'll just go through them until uh, we're done. So the first question is: Does the NNF have a timeline for silicon carbide trench process development? 
Uh, we don't have a timeline for, uh, for trench processing. Uh, that's a more challenging edge process. Uh, I am not confident that our edge tools we have right now are going to be able to handle trenches, but um, um, I, I, I can't say we're going to be doing that in the, in the near term. Okay. Uh, I think that's more of a mid to long term goal. Um, what we need to do is we need to be able to do the planar MOSFETs first. I, I, think, I think from the point of view of the timeline, it's going to be the process blocks first, specific process blocks, and then it's going to be the, the sort of integration of the process blocks into a planar MOSFET. And once that's successful, then we can get into things like trench MOSFET. So I think that's more of a mid to long term goal than the short term goal, goal extremely short term goal of the process block and the short, slightly extended uh, term of the, uh, the planar MOSFET. Okay. Going back to your comments at the very beginning, for this facility to be transitional to moving some of these uh, technologies to XFAB, for example, is it exclusive to XFAB, or could you also use these same process blocks you are developing at another fab in the U.S. someplace? Oh yeah, yeah, certainly. We're open to um, um, we're, we're open to to anyone. I mean, whatever whatever ideas that people have would have that can't get done at a typical university fab or at a, at a large fab industrial fab we're happy to, to take that work and, and, and discuss with people and work with them and see what we can do this is not this is not just for x fab this is for this is for anyone okay are there additional uh steps between what you will do in the uh, narrow fabrication facility and what the fab would have to do to actually implement these process blocks for you know moderate volume fabrication yeah, yeah, there's going to be some because we are not, at the end of this project, we're not going to be fully integrated. Um, the, way the, the, the way the project works, the way the SOPO works with the, and the way the timeline works, frankly, is we can only do the specific um, discrete blocks. Uh, so we're not, even though we have, we have our map set, we are not set up uh, for a, a fully integrated MOSFET process right now. The discrete blocks will get done. So if anyone wants to do a fully integrated process, even at the end of this project, it's going to be there will be some time and some development to get to that point. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> someone wants to text privately with you, so I'll give you that number when we're done. Certainly. Uh, another question is: Can you say a little about electrical characterization setup, especially for wafer probing level? Yeah, for, for wafer probing, we don't have a, 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 a set right now. We would probably look to other colleagues. Like, for example, we would to uh, Professor Bong for the electrical characterization we had in, in this data. Um, at NNF, our, our, our electrical characterization is not strong right now. It's, a, it, it's something that I see coming into our future, but right now we're focused on FAD. So, uh, so our probing and electrical testing is not where it needs to be. But we have, there's, there's several folks throughout the university, several professors that actually work with that we have agreements with to do some testing there. So that's something I can point you in the right direction, but we cannot do it in the, in the fab as well. Okay. Uh, what is the maximum wafer size you can process? Uh, for this project, it's six inch. We do have some tools where we go up to eight inch, but the majority of our tools are, are going to be six inch and small. Okay. Do you have any plans for implementing an XJ structure? Um, again, that would be more sort of down the line. We need to get the process block set first. We need to get a simple planar MOSFET done first, and then we'll go into more uh, more complex devices. So we're looking at we're looking months down the road before we get to things like that. Okay. Uh, will a transfer of a particular process block developed at NNF or foundry such as XFAB be easier or faster than developing the process directly at the foundry? Uh, well, the foundry mainly have these process blocks developed. Uh, the problem is they don't have any flexibility. Um, for example, say you decided that in or, in, in, instead of doing a silicon, silicon dioxide hard mask of a certain thickness, maybe you want to do a, a, a silicon nitride hard mask or, or, or an oxynitride uh, hard mask, or uh, maybe you want to have different feature size or different edge chemistry. Uh, XF is not going to do that for you. Um, XFAB has one set process that they want to do, and they're not going, they don't have the flexibility and, and frankly, the interest uh, to do something, you know, quote unquote, outside the box. Uh, that's where NNF comes in. Um, if you want to do something on, on a single wafer, it's like, hey, I have this great idea where I want to etch using, um, you know, a different type of plasma, a different type of gas. Is this something we'll do with you? And we can. And with this project, if we can show that we have the capability to do a mask, and you know, do a hard mask similar with similar results to uh, to what XFAB does. Being able to 
take that next step, it, 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 it gives you the flexibility to go ahead and get that done. Okay. Do you have process steps on the back side of the NNF? Um, we don't have anything beyond wafer dicing. That's sort of the last, uh, last step in the process we do. There is another facility on NC State campus, the, uh, the freeze facility, that does packaging. So if you need to do any, any sort of um, wafer bonding or, or, or bumping or, or anything like that, there is just another facility in NC State that has that's Doug Hopkins. Doug Hopkins. Doug Hopkins. Doug Hopkins. Yep. Okay. Uh, someone else asked about the wafer size that you already addressed. Right, right, right. Six inch. Six inch. Yeah, everything yeah, does six yeah. inch. Some, some tools do eight inch, but, but I would six inch and smaller is what we uh, typically do. And several people have asked for the, uh, a copy of the presentation, so I'll ask you to Certainly. type into the chat window your email address, and as soon as I get the mm -hmm. presentation from Phil, I'll send it out to everyone who wants a copy of it. Uh, I don't, okay. WebEx doesn't capture your email address, so you'll need okay. to send it to me through the chat window for me to send you a copy of the presentation. Okay. So, so is this, this is text bubble? Is that what you're you? Oh, don't, you know, yeah, yeah, I'll okay. take care of it afterwards. Okay. I'll, I'll do the sending afterwards. Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, any final questions before we uh, close out for the day? Going once, going twice. Okay, thank you again for joining us. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, the March uh, webinar lined up yet as we're trying to work in some of our small businesses to give webinars as well as uh, faculty projects, and there are two or three I'm negotiating dates with, but I'll be sure to get that information out to you in plenty of time. And once again, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Phil Barletta for his time and preparing and giving an excellent presentation. So, uh, yeah, thank you, Hannah. I appreciate the opportunity. Okay. Uh, I'll leave this uh, meeting open for a few minutes, so go ahead and uh, find that chat button, send me your email address, and I'll get the presentation to you uh, as, soon as, uh, as soon as I can. Thanks very much, and have a great day.